everybody, it's William Carter here with InquisitiveCarter.com. What do you define, or how do you define Black music, quote unquote Black music? Because I think a lot of people nowadays, they kind of specify to R&B and hip hop, but the reality is all music derives from Black music. So this pigeonholing of artists in one genre is really kind of productive to our history. Yeah, Black music is a feeling, it's a vibe that comes and it's created by Black folks. And it has been appropriated as well by others. Um, what I don't like about the appropriation is the lack of accreditation and economic participation. Uh oh, Sonia Sanchez, here we go. Um, <laughs> but real talk. So, Black music is a feeling, it, it is an energy, it is an articulation of a people who love, who have lost, who suffer, who struggle, who persevere, who party, who live life to its fullest with a great energy and vitality that comes primarily from us being Black folks. And you're right. I mean, when you look, and, and we're, we're genreless as well, although we create the genres. And within those genres, we have sub-genres. Uh, so remember the merging of hip hop and R&B when that started happening. And now I had a conversation with a journalist yesterday at Hits Magazine, Simon and I were talking about this current um, ideation of hip hop. There, there are pockets of it, but there have always been pockets of different types of hip hop. You had gangster rap, you had the conscious rap, and I'm all for that. And I'm not putting down, you know, I prefer certain other types. I mean, I'm a tribe called Quest girl, okay? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a public enemy girl, I'm that girl. Uh, I'm a Lauren Hill girl, but they're, you know, we're not monolithic. So people are creating different aspects and perceptions of the music, like trap. A lot of people don't like trap hip hop, but again, trap hip hop is huge. And a uh, hip hop is the number one selling genre, period, of any genre in the world. It's hip hop, number one, globally. So that's part of that is trap. There's a place for trap, obviously. It blew up and people love it. And it ain't just black people blowing up our music. So black music is a universal language that is felt and understood by billions and inspires other people to interpret our music. Some do it well. Some people love Sam Smith. Some people love Post Malone. Some people love Machine Gun Kelly. Why people have always been successful in finding someone to be the imitator of the originator. So there was Little Richard, they came up with Jerry Lee Lewis. There was Bo Diddley, they came up with, you know, they had their counterparts to make it more palatable to white audiences. You know, white parents didn't want their white teenage daughters leaning after a little Richard. So here's their answer. Okay, let's get Elvis Presley, who, by the way, most of his songs were written by Black people. Uh, black woman cooked his food, kept his house. Uh, black people drove him. He grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, around a bunch of Black people. But here was a white boy who could move, could play the guitar, kind of cute, could sing, and book. Did, did black music, but white audience felt, many white audiences felt more comfortable getting it from Elvis rather than Little Richard. Right. It's funny you say that because my earliest memory of seeing that or realizing that was a thing was watching Dreamgirls. And when they talked about, you know, Elvis and it was like, well, who did uh, Hound Dog? And it was like, no, nah, it was Big Mama Thornton. And that was my first that's something I've, I've always taken with me over the years and it ended up coming back because I had a class in college a music business class and he, my professor was black and he was talking about that 
and I was the only person that knew that answer. And I just saw it full circle. Like, so not only did I not know back then, but white people still don't know the reality of it now. And this was in 2013 when I took that class. So I'm just like, things come full circle, but that was my first time really seeing it on screen and like taking that lesson, not fully understanding what it was, but realizing later on. Yeah. Big Mama Thornton, I mean, just there's a cavalcade of artists who have gone uncredited. Um, and I mean, not just uncredited in terms of recognition that's talking about them, but <laughs> compensated either for their creativity, for their work, for writing those songs, performing them originally. Um, yeah, uh, again, another travesty, the ongoing travesty of racism. I have people too say to me, I've had white people say, why has it got to be all the time black? And why has it got to be racism? I was like, great question. One that I would encourage you to consider. You're asking me as a black woman, do you know what it's like to walk into a store and have somebody follow you or monitor you when you've got an American Express platinum card in your wallet and can buy anything up in this bitch? <laughs> what? It happened to Oprah. It happened to Oprah. We're talking about a billionaire woman who went shopping, asked to see a bag in a store. I think she was in Switzerland. I forgot, she was someplace in Europe. And the young lady was like, oh, it's like very expensive. And Oprah's like, yeah, and that would not be a problem for me. I could probably buy this brand. <clears throat> Bring that bag down here. <laughs> no, I know I keep referring to racism, but it is one of the ills in our world, not just here in America. William, I went to South Africa a few years ago to present uh, at a conference called Black Portraitures, organized by Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Dr. Deborah Willis, and some other esteemed academics. And it broke my heart. It's the only place in the world that I ever wanted to go to was South Africa. First Africa, and I did that. Then South Africa. Racism is real. They've just reinvented their apartheid. Just like here in America, they've reinvented or push the goal for, um, for it, with racism. They, they just keep changing to accommodate, to keep black people, brown people down and keep white people elevated. And let me tell you something, I have white people in my family. I was looking at my genealogy the other day. I, I'm, I'm into genealogy and where you come from and DNA and all of that kind of stuff. I have white blood in me, I have white ancestors. But at the, at the end of the day, my white ancestors and my white relatives, they're doing way better than the black side of the family. They're doing way better. And why should that be? Because your color is lighter? No, no, let's just even out this playing field. There's, there's plenty for all of us, but that's not how the wealthy perceive it. They need, they need folks to work for them to keep their wealth up. And that's something that has to be changed. But see, I'm all up on my Minneapolis right now, William. I mean, this is a, a, a night and a morning of watching the indignation of another Black man begging for mercy, begging for the opportunity to breathe and not given, not afforded that and having his life snuffed out of him on cameras for the entire world to see. Wow, they just didn't care. That cop just did not care, did he? No. And we're talking, oh, we're talking about a, a black man who was handcuffed. He was handcuffed on the ground. Couldn't do anything. And he was held down by two other cops with the one on his neck. So he wasn't going nowhere. He wasn't doing anything. What and he did not resist from what we could see. He did not resist. Right. He was talking, but he wasn't like, you know, trying to hit them or kicking or screaming. Right. He was cooperative. From what I could see, he did not deserve to die. Mm. So would you say the lack of respect for Black people or understanding of Black people was one of the reasonings in the creation of Black Music Month? Well, the, the reason for the establishment of June Black Music Month by Kenny Gamble, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Grammy Award winning songwriter, producer, broadcaster Ed Wright, myself and members of the Black Music Association then, do some research on BMA, 
uh, William, I'd be very curious to see what you come up with, but was to establish a period of time, a concentrated period of time, where we could celebrate the outstanding contributions of music creators, past, present, and the generation to come. The interest was in galvanizing members of the music industry community to strengthen our position um, and help the world overstand that we're an economic engine as well. We feel good, you know, it'll make you dance, party, get down, turn up, make you think. But at the end of the day, it's a business. And we were not properly participating in the compensation, the remuneration financially of this business that we helped to create. So it was an effort for us to focus for that month, just like we do with Black History Month. There's a country music month. There's a Latino month. So there wasn't a Black Music Month. We established it. And President Jimmy Carter hosted the first Black Music Month event, June 7th, 1979, on the lawn of the White House. Chuck Berry performed, Sarah Powell, Evelyn Champagne King, Dexter Wanzell, members of the Mother, Father, Sister, Brother, MFSB. It was a beautiful day. There were approximately maybe 300 music industry guests, people who worked in the Black music industry. It was wonderful. That just sounds so beautiful and so like enriching and so cultured. Like, I would love to be here. <laughs> Yeah, it was, listen, I was there, I sat with President, uh, um, I was gonna say, um, Carter. Uh, it, it was, you know, Gamble and I sat there with pride and it was the beginning of what we felt would be an ongoing movement of keeping black folks united and together. And it's morphed, it morphed into other things, but 41 years now we have been celebrating in some shape, form or fashion why is black music month important because it is our month it's our it's 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 how you wake up in the morning it's what sustains you through the day if you look at tv and i i challenge you to do this now william look at tv commercials and see how much black music you hear to sell everything from arthritis medication which i saw last night to cars soap toothpaste you name it Black music is at the very core and foundation. It's the underpinnings of so much. And then when you look at other areas of our culture, sports, name it, TV, anything, films, where is black music front and center? It's funny. Give us the credit we deserve. Right. It's funny that you mentioned commercials because um, just recently on Twitter, people, you know, people find old archive videos and they're like, we share a lot of people found like well like they reposted the old mcdonald's commercials from like early 2000s and it was very r&b dancing in the rain type style and we're, in, we're all like oh my god this happened this slide we liked this back then but like it's so like i remember those even before they replayed it i remember those commercials so like and it stuck with me so definitely like be more mindful now moving forward when you watch television or whatever you'll see here black music just just pay us and acknowledge that it's us don't try to take it steal it claim it as your own that's foul so over the last 41 years outside of the first initial one under president carter are there any mm -hmm. uh, key moments to you that like just stick out in terms of celebration Oh yeah, when I met uh, Bob Marley and Bob Marley and Stevie Wonder performed together. This was during the Black Music Association and the establishment of June Black Music Month. Ta tons of pristine moments. We honored Count Basie at Radio City Music Hall, Lena Horne, all these great artists were there. Uh, so many moments over the course of 41 years of celebrating, recognizing Black music. Uh, but now, William, I must say that I am a proud board member of the National Museum of African American Music, Nashville, Tennessee, Music City. And we will be opening prayerfully Labor Day weekend. If we cannot open physically, we will do a virtual opening, a soft opening. But I've been on the board for some years and I'm very proud of this institution. Uh, so far we've raised $60 million. 
I did a heart hat visit last year and tears came to my eyes. It is an amazing facility on Fifth and Broadway in the heart of downtown Nashville, Tennessee, immediately across the street from the original Grand Ole Opry, the Ryman Auditorium. And it is going to be a repository, a resource for research. You have to come, William. I know you'll love it because you, you're that guy and you're aware of our culture and our music, but it will represent all genres of black music. Our, our motto is appropriately taken from George Clinton, one nation under a groove. And that's what we do. Um, so I am so proud of, I, I'm also the co-chair of the Music Industry Relations Committee with LaRon Rogers, who is an attorney. And my committee has some of the bad asses people on the planet in the music business, some names you would recognize and others you might not. But we are working diligently to make this a world-class institution where people can come in and see the connection. They could be Asian, they could be Latino. We want them to connect to what we have done as a people, the body of work that has been created and is still being created. And it's definitively American music made by Black folks. But it's music that we share, our gift to the world. So I encourage people to visit NAMAM. It's again, the National Museum of African American Music, Nashville, Tennessee. They can go online um, and we encourage people to become members, to join our organization, bring your families and learn more about our history, our contributions to black music. I love this. To the world. I love this. I want to go just like, that's me. It's just a comp, like, I, I love that. Oh, you definitely listen. That's why I say you're a prime person, but you already, you're there already. Our museum is for the people who also are not there and do not know the culture, the history of, you know, the field hollers, the blues, uh, R&B, the various genres. Remember when I mentioned the trunk of the tree and the branches? That's what you'll see also at the museum. But it's all rooted in Africa. It is all rooted in the drum. It's all rooted in the experiences of Black people coming from Africa over here, separated from their loved ones. I mean, think about what we've had to endure, being whooped, being raped, being assaulted being talked down to, being told you can't learn how to read and write. Imagine if you and I, I love reading. I am a voracious reader. I can't imagine life without the ability to read a book. And Black people were told, they made laws, I see your books. <laughs> black people were told <laughs> though, read. you can't, yeah, I gotta read too. I remember being on a plane one time, I did not have a book with me or newspaper or magazine. I read the card, the emergency card <laughs> over and oh cuckoo crazy, but I'm sorry. I had to read. <laughs> I kept reading the emergency card. Okay, in the event of an emergency, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, but okay. But yeah, you, you will love it. And I'm personally inviting you to come. I, I would definitely would love for you to come, uh, keep you informed and connect you to our people so that you can learn more. But I would like everybody who is listening, watching in the story to visit the National Museum of African American Music. You can go online. And we're doing, we're doing stuff online, William, as well right now, virtually. We've been doing it prior to the pandemic. So you, we have um, CBS this morning did a great story on us. You can go online, get that as well to give you the virtual tour of the museum and it will heighten your excitement even more. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to watch and look, and look at that after because Oh my God, that just sounds so much fun. Like, I can't believe it. <laughs> and we've got artists like Keb Mo, India Irie. They're all involved and they're supporting. And I'm working over time to get more artists of this generation as well engaged and involved because it's not your great great grandmother's museum. It's more than that. It's fly, it's hip, it's relevant, it's current, it's modern, it's of us, for us, by us. Boo boo. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, how do you find yourself celebrating Black Music Month? I get to talk with good people like you. I am on a mission this month. I am 
talking to hundreds of thousands, millions of people. I'm doing The Breakfast Club next week. Angela Yee, who is on my music industry relations committee for the museum, invited me. I'll be doing a lot of media. I will be um, sharing with my grandson. He has a, a little section of books, his personal library in my house. I will be reading books about my favorite artists and you know, there are different ways to, I will be donating uh, as much as I can. I do all the time. I'm constantly giving money to different organizations that support my agenda of music education and music elevation. So, and these are ways that other people can do their celebration of Black Music Month. Listen to your favorite artists, stream their music. They'll get paid. Uh, buy their merch. Buy books. You know, support people who are the music creators. Send an email or a text to someone that you admire, an artist, and say, your music has helped me on this journey of life. There's just a myriad of ways that you can be celebrating, and that's what I will be doing. In addition to doing, um, I'm moderating a panel next week, I think, about today's music industry online, of course, via Zoom, which is how we're doing things at this time. So there are a plethora of ways that one can support Black Music Month. I will be talking to Kenny Gamble, my partner in this life journey that we've been involved with Black music. Anytime we see uh, another entity, like let's say Apple Music does this whole Black Music Month campaign, most of the digital platform services do that. So I'll call Gamble and say, did you see, did you see, did you see? Because it makes us proud, like Pam parents and we are actual parents we have three kids and we have a grandchild but it gives us great joy to see that more and more people are recognizing and overstanding it's not just celebrate it's take action listen to your favorite radio station support the advertisers that support that radio station um, there's just tons of ways use your economic power to keep this this cultural and economic entity going so there are many ways. That's a long answer to your short question, William. I will be celebrating. I'm celebrating now. And I'm not saying just during June. June is that concentrated month. I'm saying celebrate Black music every day. That somebody drives past your house booming out a song. Get in the groove. Use this music to empower you. If you're feeling down, especially during this pandemic, listen to a Donny Hathaway, Someday We'll All Be Free. Listen to Curtis Mayfield, We're Moving On Up. Watch the Wale video. There's tons of things that you can do to embrace those that are creating, making this music. So I'll be celebrate good times. Come on. Yes, honey, every day. Let's go. I'm sad. Let me put on some Aretha Franklin. I took my shower last week. I took like a 40 minute shower and I listened to Aretha Franklin the whole shower. And it was beautiful. So not only did I get clean and relaxed, but I was lifted up by the Queen of Soul. Listen to some music. Party. With yourself. Have a good time. What are you going to be doing, Black Music Month, William? Normally, um, we'll have a lot of things that I'm going to put out during this month, including this interview. My goal is to have this up by June 1st. So literally, Yay. the first day, that's when I'm trying to have it up. Um, Excellent. But normally, just what I do, keep promoting, keep doing it. Um, normally do like a challenge or like every day I'll post facts about different artists in terms of number of records sold, Grammys, or um, like, or just find ways to get the people that follow me interactive about the culture and about the music and just like more dive in depth you know so i'm working on a new 30-day challenge now um as well as facts because that's i love doing that like it just like just putting out little things there like it just excites me especially getting to edit things as long as i can be here for the people for the culture for the music that's what i want to do perfect and and another thing we need to support you we need to support people who are perpetuating the culture accurately, who are speaking to the music makers, to the advocates. 
you are that you are part of that movement so we we need to subscribe to your channel we need to support listen we need to share your which is what i will be doing like i said the sean stockman interview i loved it you know we're talking philly boys to men but i loved him talking about where he is they have sold in excess of 10 million records so you know some people because i know at some point in the conversation he said something or you said something about yes being that 90s you know group but no, they're still, they did a residency in Las Vegas recently, a long-term residency. But it was, it's nice when you come out of the collective, because the reality is Sean is still an individual. And right. he had individual ideas. And as he said in his interview with you, he wrote those songs. You know, he lived these songs. He felt these songs. And I also kind of heard him say, and if nobody other than his immediate family and friends listened to it, He's okay with that too. Right. He's okay with that too. But of course he's very paid and he can say that. <laughs> and we know that more than his family and his wife are gonna listen and support. But I haven't heard the album. But your interview with him made me want to go. And I'm going to go this weekend. I'm gonna go support his project and then I'm gonna reach out to him and let him know that I heard his interview with you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I really do. I appreciate you. Like, it just like, like I said, like it's just like certain moments or certain things. Just like you keep getting like signs from the universe that like, hey, mm -hmm. keep going, keep pushing forward, keep you know, stop stressing yourself out as much. Just, just go, and it just like this. It just like it's making my heart full and it may sound like i don't know like some people may say like it's corny but like genuinely because i haven't had like the the easiest life at all mentally so things like this it just makes me like what you struggled for in the past is part of you but you can't let it be all of you so keep going to use that so that's all I, you know i keep trying to do you're bringing me to tears william and i pray that Again, when it gets difficult, put on some music made by somebody whose life too was difficult. Think about those artists that we've been referring, we've talked about so many artists, but think about the challenges that they face, the indignation of being talented, smart, capable, and being denied entry into a front door of a restaurant or a hotel. Think about those indignities that those artists suffered that the people whose names you and I will never know had to endure the indignities of racism, but made life better for us, even though it's still rough and tough and bad. All those people who protested, who marched, who walked, SNCC, you name it, Snokely Carmichael, all of these, the Black Panther movement, Huey P. Newton, all of these people who put their lives, who put their courage out front, so that you and I could walk in the front door of a restaurant. But even still now, when we walk into an establishment, somebody is, did you see the video, William, of the five brothers who went, I think it was in, I'm not sure where it was. I want to say Chicago, but they went into their gym and a white man was like, oh, did you see that? Yeah, uh-huh. He was questioning them. Apparently they, uh, they fired, well not fired, but they got rid of his office, the white man's office. Um, something, something else was happening, but, you can't even go in the gym without being looked at. It, like, they, no. they had offices in that building, but he started questioning them and they were like, yo, we, we, we were in this building too, but you don't have any right to question us like you do, like you just did. But he also called the police. Five black men in the gym. Wow. And all they did, five young brothers coming to work out to stay healthy and had a right to be there. Mm. Ooh, honey, I'm fired up, let's go. I'm about, <laughs> about I'm just, and, and this has been going on for a long time. This ain't nothing new. It ain't nothing new. Right. I'm, I'm a grown woman, William. I am grown. I'm a grandmother. So I lived through the 60s, 70s, 80s, every era I've seen the ongoing. But that's why I'm saying music, black music in particular, is a source of comfort and inspiration and 
you and I as advocates, as people on the front line of this, of promoting and preserving our culture, we have to continue to have these conversations about protecting our music and protecting black people, all people. I want, I'm, I'm that girl, I'm very pro us, but I'm also pro, like I said to you earlier, I want everybody to be good. William, it's been an honor. It has been a pleasure. I'm gonna continue. I know there are more interviews that you've done that I cannot wait to listen to. I'm gonna nosedive, but I am a supporter, I'm your cheerleader, and I am grateful to you for affording me this opportunity to share with your audience the importance of celebrating June Black Music Month for everybody. Thank you so much. Like I said, I appreciate it. I truly do because you didn't have to respond. You didn't have to reply. You didn't have to do anything that you didn't I respond. had to. You compelled me. You compelled me. And all those people that you're, how are you getting these interviews? You're writing to them like you wrote to me, right? Okay. So you have power and you're using your power for good. So you're one of my superheroes. So yeah, I'm telling you, I get tons of emails. I had to respond. You compelled and commanded me to. Thank you. Truly. You're welcome, William. <laughs>